Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Uh, while I have you here, please consider supporting Youth Empowerment and Support Services, otherwise known as YES. Based in Edmonton, Alberta, YES provides immediate and low-barrier overnight and day shelter, temporary supportive housing, and individualized wraparound supports for young people aged 15 to 24. They work collaboratively within a network of care focused on the prevention of youth homelessness by providing youth with the necessary supports to stabilize their housing, improve their well-being, build life skills, connect with community, and avoid re-entry into homelessness. Learn more about how to donate or otherwise support YES by visiting YESS.org. Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Beach and Creative Control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Beach's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends, uh, but the truth is he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up-and-coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with Uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as though he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. Ian Blurton is a multi-talented singer, musician, songwriter, producer, and live performer based in his hometown of Toronto, Ontario. As a producer, Blurden has worked on records by the likes of The Weaker Thans, Attack in Black, Hot Kid, Cursed, and Burning Love, among many others. As a singer and guitarist, he's renowned for his trailblazing work in his own bands like Change of Heart, Blurtonia, Come On, Public Animal, and most recently, Ian Blurton's Future Now, whose new album, Second Skin, might well be the most ambitious and fully realized record he's ever made. Ahead of a Second Skin record release show at Toronto's Horseshoe Tavern on Saturday, August 13th, 2022, Ian returned to this show for a talk about making this album in Calgary's Studio Bell with the legendary Rolling Stones Mobile Studio, getting to use Neil Young's high-end studio gear and some of Randy Bachman's vintage guitars, how Glenn Milcham of Blue Rodeo goes absolutely ballistic on the drums whenever he works with Ian, and a brief history of the double kick pedal. Whether or not Toronto has been, or ever will, live up to its potential to be a cool city. Lyrical themes and threads connecting the songs on Second Skin and Ian's songwriting of late, album art collaborations, brand new music, other future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast, and spread the word about it, and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control, plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario. This is episode 707 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented dub enthusiast Ian Blurton, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hey, Ian, how's it going? It's amazing. How are you? Oh, I'm decent, thank you. Thank you very much. Where in the world are you today? I'm in Toronto. Nice. How are things uh, in Toronto for you today? What's your day looking like? This is my day, what I'm doing right now. Just me? Yep, just you and then hanging out with cats. Oh, well, that's that's a pretty good day. Yeah, I I I like those kind of days. How many cats do you have? You said cats, so several? Two. Oh, okay. What are their names? Uh, boots and Buttons. 
Boots. Boots, you went with alliteration uh, there. These are your cats in particular, or are they well, yeah, someone else? Mine and my, my girlfriend's, yeah. Parents. Okay, yeah, right. Boots and buttons. Uh, yep. are, they good ca- are they good cats? Oh, God, they're awesome, yeah. Have you, are you a cat person generally? Have you always had cats? Yeah, I've had cats. I did. There was a stretch where there was no cats, but now there are cats again. Yes, I've always, pretty much always had a cat. I miss my cat, Gary, every day. Passed away, uh, what was it, uh, 2014. Anyway, I miss him. Right. I haven't, I can't replace uh, animals. I have trouble. People are like, why don't you get another cat? Immediately. And I just oh, I haven't. See. I can't quite do it. I don't know what it is. I should probably oh. just do it. I think it would be good. But there's yeah. Alan. Did you, did you go with the stretch without cats? Was was someone in your life allergic or something? No, I just uh, no. I just it just wasn't cat time. It wasn't cat time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, no, just curious because we have allergies here, and that's another problem. People get uh, hyper allergic to the cats. More than the yeah. dogs, it seems. Yeah. I, get the- I was actually, when we first got the cats, I, I was I felt the allergies, but now it's gone again. Oh, good. Well, I, I hope to hear from Boots and Buttons, uh, at least one of them, during the course of our conversation. Uh, that would be fun. Now, I have uh, a question to ask you right away uh, about the uh, lyrics, uh, one set of lyrics on your uh, oh, wonderful God. new record. Oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> here we go. So one of the lyrics on your new album... Uh, it stuck out for me. It's from the song Denim on Denim. Yeah. And you sing, Who Creates Control? And I want to tell you that I know the answer to this one. It's me. It's me. It's you. Oh, I see. You create control. I oh, create God. control. You see, that's the oh, name of the God. show. You see what I'm doing right. there? I assumed, yeah. I assumed this was me swimming around in your heart and your mind. And uh, then when you were penning your lyrics with your pen and your paper... You thought, yeah. oh, this will be a little nod to Vish and his amazing yeah. podcast. Is There's that- actually a bunch of little nods to <laughs> Canadian uh, things in, in the lyrics. There's uh, the chorus in Second Skin is uh, the Ghosts of Modern Man, who are a, a band from Regina that I absolutely loved. So there's, uh, yeah. There's so there's some, like that. what we call here, uh, for those listening around the world, we uh, have a thing uh, that's mandated by our uh, broadcast regulator. Uh, we, call, <laughs> we call it... Uh, we call it CanCon, which is a way of calling it can- Canadian content. So you have loaded this brilliant new record with CanCon. Is that what you're saying, Ian? Yeah. Oh, it's full of CanCon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a wonderful, wonderful record. Uh, I can't stop listening to it. Uh, I was going to save this to later, but I, I, th- I am going to put this out there. I feel like this is maybe your best record. The most wow. Amp- Wow. It feels like your wow. most ambitious wow. record. I don't know how else to put it. And I'm I'm generalizing and I'm going by the raw emotion I have in listening to the record a lot lately. And I'm sure if I picked up a Change of Heart record or maybe even the last Future Now record, I'd be like, you know what? I was wrong. This is the best thing Ian's done. <laughs> or a Come On record. You know, you know I'm a fan, right. but this feels... I Oh, you know what? Let's go with this. How do you feel about this record in relation to others? Does it feel particularly... Are you particularly proud of this one? I know it's it's the newest one, so I'm gathering you might want to be like, of course. But if you think on it, yeah. doesn't this feel like it feels like a lot of work? Does it feel like maybe the most elaborate thing you've done? It's definitely the most elaborate uh, outside of Smile, right, probably. Right. Like in terms of like the amount of work that went into it. Um, not that less work goes into other things, but just the, the, you know, the seven minute, there's four, seven minute songs on the record. So just getting those things to work properly, or at least what I think is working properly. Uh, yeah, it took, took a lot of work Yeah, and just having more keyboards and stuff. Yeah. It's just more expand. The arrangements are a lot bigger than normal, yeah. I guess. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, I'm glad you can relate to what I'm saying. Cause I know, uh, hearing a compliment like that or a generalization like that even can be like, what the fuck, what am I supposed to say to this? But Right, but but it feels to me like you're on the same page uh, that I am. I'm hearing it. Do you know what spurred this on at this moment in time for you to go particularly whole hog on a record? Well, actually, we were invited to be part of the Arts Residence Program at the National Music Center, Studio Bell, and um, two things there that were it probably influenced everything was uh one we were going to record on the rolling stones mobile so like led zeppelin 3 led zeppelin 4 exile on main street 
Deep Purple Machine Head, Status Quo Live at the Apollo in Glasgow. All these amazing records made on this in this truck. And so I think there was like a, well, we hopefully this record's going to be good. Let's work our asses off on it. And the other thing was that you get to choose stuff from the uh, collection. And one of the things I chose was a Mellotron. So immediately once we got the artist in residence the uh the mellotron became part of the uh the songwriting process and, and, and for those who don't know what exactly is a mellotron what does it do what what does it spur someone like you on to do uh mellotron is each it's a very very it's pretty much one of the original samplers in that each key that you hit has a piece of tape that runs i think it's roughly eight seconds and so it has flutes or boys choir. Like you can change the tapes to different things. And some people actually, you know, go random. So like one note will be a boys choir. And so they just sat a Mellotron in front of me and I noodled on it for, you know, five days and hmm. did what I could. Did you replace any of that tape with some, something of your own? No, no. We just, uh, I just went straight with what they had because it sounded great. You know, honestly, I yeah. just love the way it sounded. Now, I don't know if you know this, but my son, Levon, and I have been inside of that Rolling Stones mobile truck. Uh, we, right. Uh, did you know this? I posted photos on the one of the socials many years ago. I think we were there in, uh, I want to say it was 2018, and we got a, right. got a nice tour, and they gave us uh, some, I don't know, how did this occur? Somebody reached out to me on socials to be like, hey, I see you're in Alberta. This was before we moved here. And do you want to come get a special tour of the National Music Center? I was like, oh, sure, that sounds great. So we stopped into Calgary and we went. Anyway, uh, it was really magical for me to be inside that truck. I tried to instill the magic in my son. He was like, what, who, the rolling what? What is it? It's a, what is this, an ice cream truck? What is this? I don't understand. Uh, Did they have souvlaki on this thing or what? <laughs> he thought it was a food truck. It is actually, yeah. if you think on it, if I think on it, it's basically a food truck sized vehicle, right? Oh, 100% it is a food truck sized vehicle. Yeah, right. So uh, those of us who uh, follow music know that uh, producers like yourself or, or engineers or rooms uh, you would go into as a musician or you would work with someone uh, uh, maybe with an expectation of what you're going to get on the other end uh, because they have a sound. The room has a sound. The board has a sound. The producer or the engineer has a signature way of recording things. What was it about the truck uh, that uh, excited you, first of all, the notion of using this historical truck, you know, as you mentioned, all the records made on it. But what did you think you were going to get out of it? And uh, and also, uh, at the end of the day, do you think you got what you were hoping for? That's a big question. Uh, just honestly, the truck was, it's what you described. It's just like the fact that we were able to be in this magical space that like, uh, you know, for me, so many of my heroes have been in that truck probably smoking a cigarette listening to playback going ah no we got to do it again or you know like you know steve marriott or bebop deluxe and you know just like all these bands so there's the and you know being a fan of that kind of stuff that's a historical yeah it's a you know it's a monument it's like one of the greatest studios ever made the expectation is like because i had never really worked on a helios console specifically that one before i didn't know how it was going to sound but you know the the staff at the studio bell are just fantastic they took care of us they made it sound great they took a lot of pressure off actually because uh having only four days to record all the beds was a little like ah um yeah. and then we played it we played a live show on the fourth night so we had really only been playing these songs for like four days and then we had to play a show so it was like it was a little bit of pressure did you break out the the new songs uh for that show oh oh yeah we played the whole record actually oh. uh at the show um oh, okay. cool and then played another set of you know what we've been playing basically so just to be clear we've described the rolling stones mobile truck as a as a food truck sized uh vehicle you're not all the band is not in the truck recording the truck itself is basically like a control room uh, yes, just, uh, the truck. The truck, in fact, was on the main floor, and we were on, I believe, the third floor. Oh. And we weren't actually using the truck because uh, the whole place is tied together too by yeah. tie lines. Yeah. And actually, we weren't using the truck for playback because it was like a, a lot of up and down. Yeah. 
So we just went, we, uh, we had another studio that we would go into and listen to playback on. Are you uh, anti-exercise? You didn't want to go up and down the steps a lot? Is that what you're saying to me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. We asked for like chauffeur driven like golf carts, but yeah. they were like, no. <laughs> so it's short, um, golf carts to take into the elevator up and down, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. they're big elevators. They're they are. Big elevators. It's a wonderful. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to make this a travel and tourism segment, but it's a really wonderful facility that place oh yeah i really yeah. liked it uh, yeah yeah okay so uh i can understand what you're getting at i feel like as a musician if you know you're either working with someone or working in a place that has historical significance you just play in a in a psyched up way you're psyched so that's kind of we were psyched. we were psyched and we were also like ah was it um, was it nerve-wracking well yeah because like the first day we tried to get one song for I don't know how long and we just it did not happen I see so we were under even more pressure and then everything started clicking it was like you know you get to that point where you're like the nerves wear off and you're just like oh my god we got a lot to do let's go yeah you know yeah and and like you know for example like another thing was like the kick drum microphone they had just bought it from Neil Young and like you know it was like the vocal mic he used for everything for like 30 years so it's like you're just surrounded by this stuff and if if you can't rise up in a situation like that, then, ugh. you know, like Randy Bachman had dropped off 250 guitars like Aaron, who's the other guitar player. I'm a lefty, so he won this lottery. Right. But, you know, he's playing like a 59 Strat and he's playing, uh, you know, somebody dropped off an Explorer for him. And just like, you know, a lot of a lot of the people in the community brought like the, the band Woodhawk and Carl Chapel. Sorry, I, I hope that's how you pronounce his last name. Yeah brought gear to us just for free you know just to try and help us make the, a better record so it's like you know the the whole village thing a lot of people really helped so it's like don't make a shitty record that's amazing so you basically were playing in a living museum across the board it wasn't just the mobile studio you've got oh no it's the whole place yeah. it's the whole place yeah like even the uh the mellotron that i was using like mellotron went out of business and another company bought them and they basically sort of rebranded them and slapped a bunch together and sold them. And I was using one of the weird ones. So it's like, it was even a rare Mellotron, yeah. you know? One of the uh, major attractions at the uh, music center there is the uh, Tonto uh, synth synthesizer, yes. which I believe it's up a couple of floors. I, I want to say, I can't remember. I think it's on the, it's it's higher, right? It's not on the main floor. Is it? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, this was most recently uh, made uh, sort of famous, I guess, by uh, our friend, our colleague Robin Hatch, uh, made, made a yes. record uh, using that thing. Uh, did you use that in any way? Did you want to try to uh, incorporate that? No, I don't. I think that would have been. Uh, I think that's the kind of thing where you kind of spend five days with it. Yeah, you know, like just that thing. Cause it's massive. Like as pe I don't, people probably don't know how big it is, but it's I don't know, fifteen feet across. No, it's yeah, know, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. Rich Coin actually also made a record on it recently as well. Yeah. So for those who don't know, and I I'll, I don't want to mangle the history, but yeah, this was like the one of the first synthesizers, I believe. Well, it's like one of the first synthesizers that has like a couple of drum machines, a right. couple of bass type things, a synth. I, th I believe it takes it you know, a couple of people to run the thing. Yes, that's right. And then Stevie would sort of, it, I, you know, it was built for Stevie Wonder. It was right? so built it was for like, Stevie Wonder, that's correct, yeah. And he would just basically jam out in the middle of it with a bunch of people, you know, helping him out. Right. And then it's also in um, Phantom of the Paradise. In the scenes where he's playing keyboards and there's like this big thing behind him, that's that's also the Oh, wow, there. okay. So I don't recall the whole story, but it ended up in Calgary uh, and it's there. And like I say, Robin made a record and Robin's on your record is where I was coming yes. from too. Played some yeah. piano, I want to say. Yes, she played piano. Yeah, right. Incredible. I, I have nothing but respect for Robin. She's amazing. Yeah, she's very funny uh, too. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, she's really, she's great to work with, period. I find um, in person sometimes Robin can be very quiet. But uh, she's really <laughs> doing well on the show. And I know her, so we, and she was on the show, I want to say, this year or last year. I can't remember now. And it was fun. So yeah, I like her, I like her a lot. I'm, I'm glad you made that connection. So anyway, given the intricacy of these arrangements and the challenges you're putting on people in your band, how much demoing did you do of these songs versus how much stuff you were like, 
working on together in that space or other spaces? Did you do a lot of uh, did, did you do a lot of demos? Well, Glenn and I, Glenn and I did demos for everything just to get the tempos and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Anna and uh, Aaron were a little more busy, so it was more like uh, Glenn and I sort of hashing things out. And then it was really the four of us for the, those four days. The, it was definitely the four of us throwing ideas around and just trying to make everything work. You know, yeah. that's a there's actually no production credit on the record because that there was just so many people involved. Hmm. It would have been like executive producer, uh, <laughs> co, uh, you know, like just because it really was like everyone had at least one or two great ideas that worked work their way onto the records. So. I think we've covered this in the past because both you and Glenn were on this show with when Change of Heart was kind of reassembling there for a little bit. Uh, and then we, t I believe you and I talked about the last Future Now record um, on yes. this show as well. But um, can we talk a little bit for those who missed all of that stuff? It's been a few years. Glenn Milchum, for those who don't know, is the drummer in Blue Rodeo. And Blue, Ro Blue yes. Rodeo has a particular sound. Uh, here in Future Now, he is a monster. He's a punk, ro <laughs> punk rock, borderline metal uh, drummer. Lots of double kick. You mentioned Neil Young's. Yeah. I feel like you said Neil Young's vocal microphone was employed as the kick drum mic. Is that what you said? Yeah, I believe so. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Right. I mean, it's a great. It's a you know, it's a five thousand dollar mic or whatever, so it can be used for. Whatever the Do hell. you know the story about why Mr. Young would, would want to have rid himself of that thing, sell it to the center? Did they tell you? He actually sold a bunch of things to them. Uh, I think I think he just I think he put up a lot somewhere and they bought they because uh, I know they bought the the Ampeg flip top uh, bass amps, you know, you yeah, know yeah, what I'm talking yeah, about? I do. Like, yeah. So they they had two of those that Crazy Horse used apparently almost on every record and they bought both of them. And that microphone. So I wonder why they're just slowly amassing, you know, like just stuff, you know, Canadian stuff. I understand why the center would be completely uh, stoked to get that stuff and put up some dough. I guess I wonder why Mr. Why Neil? I keep calling him Mr. Young, like he's my teacher. But why? I wonder why Neil would have gotten rid of that stuff because he's still active and the crazy horses. I, I mean, we're not. You don't know. Did they tell you anything about this? Like why? No, no, I think no. I have no idea uh, why. Curious, no. huh. uh, you know, he's probably got five of them. No, I know. I, yeah, I, I gather that he's not you like know? now. What am I going to do? I sold all my amps. I'm sure yeah. he's not that you know thinking that way. But that's fascinating. Oh yeah, I, I, these are like none of his like you know classic amps right. that he's been using. You know, he's been using the same amp since I think it's '68 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Back to Glenn. Enough about Neil Young. <laughs> well, I noticed the double kick more prominently on this record. And as a drummer myself, I've never employed the thing. And I assume, for the most part in Blue Rodeo, Glenn is not double kicking. Uh, I, I can't think... Glenn is not double kicking in Blue Rodeo. No. I'm almost 100% sure of that. So this is a... I'm sure he's so excited to have this outlet. Um, I, I, he, does he play with others beyond you and Blue Rodeo these days? Uh, drums, I mean. Oh God, yeah, he's in a million. Okay, he's in a million bands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he's in... anything like this, like where he can go nuts, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, uh, uh, I know that just from being a producer, when I'm like go crazy on the drums, the most drummers are like, what, what? Most like most of the time now, it's like, can we do the opposite? Can you can you just play time? Yes, you know, of course. Kind of right, thing. right, right, right. Because you need to. Drummer is foundational. You don't want them going too crazy. It ruins the right, it will right. ruin ruin every take if they suddenly right. go crazy. But okay, let's just circle back. But to, we were like, we were like, Glenn, this is your record. Go nuts. So you know? so did did you have any input into how he played when he did? <laughs> so he'll be playing like a pretty normal to me, like a fairly normal uh, uh, rhythm uh, part, and then all of a sudden I'll just hear like the, I'll just hear it. I'll hear those. And it's great. It's like a nice texture, and it, it's fascinating. Did you have any input in terms of when to employ that thing? Or <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there's... I'm like, this is a double kick part. I'm sure I've said that at least once. Um, but I know for sure that, like, yeah, we did push him to uh, go a little more crazy than what would normally be, like in Second Skin in the, you know, what is a big vocal party. Even he said this, it's like, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing this here. It's like, well, 
Maybe you should. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for those of us who don't know the history of the double kick, and I, I can't say that I do, I feel like I I didn't really come across it until uh, 80s metal kind of stuff. Is that roughly? Right. Or am I, maybe some 70s prog probably employed it. But Oh, there's tons of 70s uh, bands with double kick. Tons. But, um, but like Bonham wouldn't have done it, right? Bonham just had a... Oh, God, no, 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 no. Right. But Bill Ward, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's... Oh God! Now I'm gonna just draw a blank. No, but, no, no, know, no, it's fine. Tommy I, Aldrich, Tommy Aldrich, you know, yeah. basically perfected the simple double kick. I mean, Motorhead, obviously, yes, you know, like, yes. and that's that's the kind of double kick that, like, I think that we're talking about. We're not talking about like new extreme metal double kick. No, like, which is like, you know, it's like, yeah. It seems to, uh, in some circles, the double kick is uh, became a bit of a cliche. Uh, yes. a bit of like a thing to almost uh, disparage or slightly make fun of, you know, but is it coming back? Do you know something I don't? Is it, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We're bringing it back, baby. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It just seemed like, I, I said this to you before, but like just when I started writing the material for this band, it was like, oh God, this really needs double kick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Fair enough. Now you knew Glenn before he was in Blue Rodeo, right? He was in. Uh, oh, I've 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 known Glenn since. Oh my God, eighty uh, four. Yes. Uh, like I was a you know I used to go see Vital Signs, which was the band he was in at the time, and you know he played in uh, he was in Change of Heart on Smile, which is ninety two. He was my neighbor uh, around that time period ninety ninety two. Yeah. You know, I've known him for a long time. So when you, you you first started working together in Change of Heart, is that fair? Yeah, I feel like we jammed before that sometime, but I don't know. Yeah, Change well, I mean, Change, Change of Heart's the first, like, serious time. So when you used to see him, again, the Blue Rodeo period is what people would know him best for, and it, it's not the kind of drumming that we're describing right now. Uh, when you would see him in Vital Signs or other bands, was he more like, the future now drummer uh that he is today or what was he yeah i mean well vital signs was more of a post-punk vibe yeah um but definitely lots of polyrhythms and stuff actually he showed me a drum beat to one of the songs like a couple of weeks ago and it was like wow that's really intricate drum part there you got yeah and so, he, he would have been kind of a kid on some level at that point oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know i used to go see him with garbage man and like oh god white noise which is more jazz and yeah you know so you two, like I'm, I'm trying to jog my own memory here because of that change of heart conversation we had. You two kind of reconnected as collaborators around the time of the change of heart uh, reassembly for Smile. Is that right? Well, well, actually, yeah. After it, I was like, uh, yeah, I guess I just, you know, we just done a bunch of shows, and I think I was just like, yeah, you know, there's the guy. He's right in front of me. Yeah, you know, it was like him and da him and Damon were played drums on the. Who are both Change Heart drummers? Uh, played on the first record, the Signals Through the Flame. So right, that's right, right. Okay, so what's that like for you to get to reconnect with uh, with Glenn in particular? Uh, fantastic. Um, I have uh, so much for respect for him as a human and as a musician, and uh, we get along great. He's opinionated. I'm opinionated. We throw opinions back and forth. We make music. It's it's great, and you know I. I always, you know, like if you find somebody who can just play parts that you don't even have to think about it, you're just like, this is how this song goes. And then he goes, oh, yeah, no, this is how this song goes or she goes. It's great. Yeah. Sometime in the last 12 years, I want to say, Glenn put out a solo record that I really enjoyed. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was like a more of a post-punk, I would say, thing. It was it was surprising to me as someone who knew him primarily as a guy in Blue Rodeo. Did he contribute to your songwriting in any uh, beyond the drumming, obviously? But did he is he opinionated about lyrics? Is he opinionated about arrangements? That sort of thing? Uh, uh, lyrics, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't, we've never had that conversation really. Hmm. And actually, I should say, I produced one of his The Swallows records, which is a band that he had in between the two playings together. Well, so maybe that's like uh, is that what I'm referring to? Maybe, uh, I don't know. I can't remember. There's a bunch. Did he do a solo record? I did a, sorry. I did, He's done a bunch of solo records. Yeah, okay, sorry. I, I did yeah. a, I ended up working a little bit with, 
whoever was representing him at the time to write the album bio. It might have been. I don't think it was a Swallows record. I think it was his own thing. But sorry, yeah. he he would know, and I feel badly now. No. My memory is um. melting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but no. So um, yes, he did contribute because he came up with a drum part, which I believe is in thirteen eight. Um, and it was like we had finished recording in Calgary, and I was like, I think we need another couple of songs for the record. And I was like, Do you have a drum beat? And he threw down this thirteen eight drum beat, and then I wrote a song around it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So he arranged, which is something I love doing. It's you know like when a drummer can just be like, "Here's a beat, and we're gonna write a song around it." Did you say what song it was? I don't know if you identified it. I might have missed that. Uh, Trails to the Gate. It's the last song. The last song. Yes. Very. It's yeah. a fascinating one in itself. Let's talk about the. Well, it is. It starts off differently than some of the others. You've got the, as I recall, off the top of my head, it starts with these vocals, right? These multi. Yeah. You did a yeah. lot of multi-tracked vocals uh, maybe more than usual i can't uh, oh way more than usual yeah yeah what yeah. was going on there sorry i don't mean to do armchair psychology but i'm always fascinated by what comes out of a pandemic uh when people right. when people are isolated uh and making stuff a lot on their own because you were really uh, and left to their own devices left to their own devices yes but you were quite diligent i thought about sharing the progress of your work on this record on Instagram in particular. Um, right. And it was often you layering, I think most, in my memory, you were layering guitars yourself, I think, probably you and Aaron, maybe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah. But putting that out there, I mean, this, this is a new tool and a new practice, uh, you know, back in our day and the old days, uh, people would quietly make their records and you would not really get too many progress reports unless you were in like a fan club well, or something, right? Yeah, we would send out postcards. <laughs> would you, would you just... Would you, well, it's true. You, I mean, it's like we used to do, we used to do change for our postcards all the time and be like, oh, we're in the studio. Oh, I didn't know you did that. Okay, that's interesting. No, yeah, yeah. So you like yeah. the notion, that's a connection thing is where I'm coming from. And uh, like you're connecting with people, like whether you're communicating yeah. something and hoping that it, it connects with people. And I appreciate that. But when someone um, in a period of isolation creates a gang vocals by themselves, I'm guessing, did you do most of the singing on the record? Did anyone else? Well, actually, what sort of what happened, uh, being as the pandemic took as long as it did, I you know, um, I had laid out the vocals for other people to sing. Oh. And there was, there was, there you know, Glenn and Anna and Aaron actually sing on the record. Oh, no, wait. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> I had I had done a lot more for them to do, and I just sort of ran out of money and ran out of time and patience and uh, just all that stuff. It sort of all came to a head, and I'm like, well, you know what? This is just going to have to do. Absolutely. So where I, again, where I'm coming yeah. from is the arm, armchair psychologist trying to figure out where, why people do the things they do in a pandemic. You're in lockdown. You create music that sounds like as many people as possible almost every song is there a song that doesn't have multi-track vocals i don't think there is i feel like they all have it and uh i wonder if that's telling of something of like trying to create a little community of voices for every song so it doesn't sound so sparse and stark and locked down like someone's by oh. by themselves that's where i'm kind of coming from you know what i'm saying wow okay yeah i didn't even think about that but yeah that uh i could see that it's a it's a production thing to do uh, to mo yeah, and and you know also like we wanted everything to be like there was kind of sort of two rules for the record is like a uh, be crazy and as over the top as possible, and also when the stupid parts happen, like make them as dumb as possible. Oh, so it's like to kind of offset the fact that like you have these sections where yes there are like you know lots of vocals going on, but like when we get to a simple part, let's try and make it as simple as possible. Well, the guitar parts are amazing. Like I, again, I'm not, I'm oh. not trying to blow smoke. I just think it's, like I say, as a fan of yours, I'm like, man, a lot of thought went into this, and there's so many intricate parts. Like I can't, I, I wish I could see it live, but here I am in Alberta, and I don't know if you'll. Be, well, I guess, hell, you do an album release show. Where better to do it than maybe at that music center? I don't know. Maybe someday you'll do that if there's time. That would be amazing. I would love that. <laughs> Full circle. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's really, really elaborate musically uh, is, I think, what we've established. Let's talk about it. I made a little joke about the lyrics at the beginning, of course, but uh, conceptually, is there? I hear threads 
running through this record. Oh. I hear, oh, yeah, there's... Uh, I hear rallying cries. I hear your your usual, I think, blend of hope uh, and some measure of rage. Fuck you. Yes, I hear <laughs> yes. that. It's yeah. It's well. it's a signature uh, calling for you, but this feels more narrative based. I hear concepts, but I don't want to put too much on it. Can you speak to this? Is there something going on on this record? That- oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like, you know, the whole that's the, the part of the prog side of things that I think that we are sort of going for. It's not like a concept record, but there's like a narrative of, you know, well, the second skin of like, if you do fuck something up there, there is something that you can do to make it better. Or, you know, the set that watching the city be torn down and like in a way that's like not helpful for, you know, a lot of like, home, you know, homeless and like, you know, bike paths and just like all this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, Toronto could right now be transforming itself into something that like, in the way like Paris is doing or even Kitchener, Ontario, like they just, announced the amazing amount of bike paths and stuff and i just feel like we're regressing sometimes the people here are, the people here are amazing though and that's probably where the what you're talking about the hope and the the positivity or whatever it's just uh the people that are here really make it worthwhile otherwise it would just be oh god yeah contextually i know you are a torontonian uh, more than most Torontonians I know. You are a born and bred Toronto person. I know you love... I was actually not born here. Oh, I correct my statement and retract it. Where were you born? I'm American. Are you? Yeah, Where were you? I was born in Illinois. Oh, shit. I knew that, actually. I'm sorry. But you are... Yep. When did you get to Toronto? Oh, a long time ago. I... Yeah, a long time you, ago. You are a pretty Toronto... Toronto-y. I am Toronto. 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 <laughs> You're more Toronto than Illinois at this point. Let's say that. How about that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah well, sure. I mean, you have... Are you proud to be from... Despite what you're saying, You're. I think you, in a hopeful way, you're a proud citizen of your of Toronto. Is that fair? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I love Toronto. I mean, the obviously, the music community here is, you know... Well, it's as good as anywhere in the world. Let's be let's be real, like yeah. in terms of anything, yeah. and just you know things like food, and I love the neighborhoods, and you know I love all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's the yeah. infrastructure and the political leadership that you're frustrated. I'm with. I'm questioning. Yeah, yeah. Spending, you know, whatever. Yeah. Has it? We could go. We could go into another conversation. It could be another. Hour, but I, but, yeah. I, I just want to get to this because contextually, I know you're from Toronto. I know you're probably, although you never reference it specifically on this record, I know the things you're talking about when you say they're tearing the city down to build it back up. Like Toronto is notoriously a construction city. A gentr- it just seems to be in perpetual gentrification or something. I don't know. The, the mm-hmm. jokes that I would hear from comedians uh, whenever, every year I went to JFL 42, which is the... Just for Laughs, Toronto edition. They, I forget what the 40, 42 acts, I guess. Anyway, the common... Re, re, every year, someone would make this joke. Hey, it's great to be uh, uh, here in Toronto. Great city. It'll be even better when you finish it. Because it was just always, always under construction. You can't go anywhere. So anyway, right. sorry. I don't know if you're getting to... I assume that's an allusion to that. This constant cranes in the air. Yeah. And... and well, yeah, supposedly we had, you know, at one point, I think it was last year, we had like as many cranes as almost anywhere in the world up. Yeah. And um, just, you know, tearing down some absolutely gorgeous, I just, the whole front, just leaving the uh, front of a building up, just. The facade, man, that yeah. bums me out. Yeah. Yeah, that bums me out. Yeah. So where I'm coming from again is I can pick up on the Toronto parts uh, of this record myself. But that that's, you know, that's also universal. That's, I think that's happening everywhere, you know. Um, that's where I'm coming from. You know, just yeah. the, mono, the mono, mono culture, you know, like, which, you know, the average person I don't think wants that, you know. But when, in your lifetime, did you ever feel on a political leadership level or a, an infrastructural level, urban planning level, was there ever a period where you're like, I think things are actually going to be okay. I like the mayor. I like the council. I think we're going to be all right. Have you ever totally felt like if you think on it? Ha- I think I was on tour in the Netherlands when I felt that. <laughs> Certainly not a Toronto. Oh, really? Well, actually, you know, I, I just think like 
Oh, actually, you know, some of the the mayors in the seventies and stuff were pretty rad. Yes. Uh, you know, 80s. and you were you were around, for, but you were a kid, I'm guessing. Oh yeah, yeah. So you were not, not like, that old. No, I know. I'm just trying to just trying to contextualize. So in the seventies, you felt what I'm saying is, as a child or as a kid, as a teen, you may not realize the power we all had to impact the decisions that are made. So you might right. be like, oh, they, I think that, you, and we tend to be more trusting. You can be cynical and, 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 and scrutinize things, but you tend to have to, out of necessity, be like, I think the leaders know what they're doing. I have to think that. Otherwise, I'm going to be depressed and not be able to function. Uh, mm. But then as you I don't get, think I've ever thought that. I don't no. think I've ever thought that, no. Okay, so no. what I'm getting at is, in my lifetime, I can't think of a time where I felt like Torontonians were happy with what was <laughs> what was going on. Like, in general... My friend Noah23 right. has a lyric uh, that I always think is funny. It's uh, pissed off like I'm living in Toronto. And because uh, <laughs> there's just this agitation. Like, I know you love it, but there's a sense that it could be. There's always the sense that it could be something better than it is, that it's not right. li living up to its potential. Does that resonate with you? Oh, yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it's like that's 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 sort of, I think, something that uh, driving it maybe a little bit is that. The potential, I mean, yeah, like the parkland and stuff that we have and just, uh, I, I mean, I don't have the solutions, obviously. No. I'm a, a rock musician. But just seeing the way other other cities are doing it, you know, like Paris bringing in all those bike paths as, as well, you know, and just uh, realizing that this is a good time to be doing that kind of stuff as opposed to waiting and like and then in toronto it's like we close the lakeshore down for bikes for a day and the guy from the blue jays is like oh we can't have that anymore yeah you know but right. the indy the indy 500 or their indy what or no sorry the it's called F1. some yeah it's called something else the molson or whatever uh, the yeah yeah the cars the, car, the cars, the race go, cars around. go around lakeshore yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, that's it. You know, it's like it, no one's going to complain about closing that. You know, no one's going to be like, oh, we should close that down. You know? Well, I mean, I'll just to be clear for people who haven't maybe been to Toronto, there are bike lanes of some kind. It's not totally, but it's all like some residue from when there was some sort of progressive leadership, whether provincially or in a municipal sense, right? It's just yeah, the, yeah. the current, I'll tell you, like one, on the list of reasons why. We left Ontario for, uh, it's going to sound perverse to you because we moved to Alberta, which if Ontario has a conservative leadership, then Alberta has an ultra conservative leadership. But they followed an NDP, uh, which is in, for all uh, intents and purposes, one of the most left leaning governments, uh, parties rather, that we have in Canada. Anyway, my point is on the list of things uh, for me about the decision to leave was the government at the time, the provincial government, because right. they were kind of, and I feel like everyone's, and they just won again. They got reelected. Your hope is to wait these people out. How did you feel about, yeah. sorry, I don't know what your political affiliations are. I have a sense of them. How did you feel? How did you feel about that? Oh, uh, it was a bummer. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say. You know, it's like, He's just not my type of person at all. I just mean, like, if you're, we've talked about the hope for change mm -hmm. in you, and then you see something like that happens, I can, it must impact that hope. It must diminish it just a little, or do you just... Well, I just see so much, you know, I live in Parkdale, and I just see so much action yeah. of people helping people here um, that it's really easy to be inspired by that. Like, I live right beside Park, which is like, you know, the Parkdale drop-in center. Yeah. So I, I see these people in walking in and out of there every day. So it's like I, I it's easy to see positive things happening. You know, I will say just to give you some perspective. So yesterday I had to I decided to ride my bike to the bank machine because the the, the phone wouldn't read the check I got. So I was like, ah, I got to go put it in the real machine. And I biked there and there's nothing. There's no bike lanes at all from my house to the downtown uh, or I mean, it's pretty close to downtown, uh, bank. I had to ride the light rail. I had to ride on the currently not functional, uh, light rail track. It's the only place I oh. could get away from the cars. My wife's, oh. my wife started biking to work. Uh, she works at the university of Alberta and the first day, some car yelled, someone in a car, not the car itself. They haven't become sentient. 
someone in the car screamed, hey, you biker, get off the road. And we're in Edmonton, which is the most progressive part of this province. All I'm getting at is things could be way worse uh, yes, yes. in Toronto. And uh, anyway, sorry. Let's talk a little bit more about this narrative, the second skin concept. Second skin, skin as a lyrical motif pops up a few times on this record. It seems to be a, yes, a, a central yeah. theme. Uh, and why? What is that? No, you alluded to what it might mean. But what? Well, it's it's just uh, it's not even necessarily a rebirth. It's like you know, you know, you just wait. You know, sometimes in life you just wake up one day and you realize you've gotten to a new point in your life uh, without even necessarily noticing it. It's just something in you has evolved and uh, brought you to that point, and sort of that's sort of what it's about as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's I don't know. Discussing lyrics is is weird. Yeah, you you alluded to just so people know, I'll give people a little bit of inside baseball here. I asked you for the lyric sheet and it took you a while. You didn't want to <laughs> I don't think you were happy to send it. Uh but I and I appreciate that. However, I can tell by reading them, you've spent a fair amount of time thinking about them. And I right. I know from our past and our interactions and the sounds of your records, I have a sense of who your influences are musically. I don't recall ever really asking you um, questions about narrative storytellers that have inspired you, whether they're authors right. or writers. Uh, I'm picking up on oh. I'm picking up on on those influences a bit. Sorry, not to discount any great songwriters. I know there's a long history, no. a long history in metal and punk and all rock idioms, frankly, of people trying to connect their songs. In so, with some sort of narrative thread and they go, some people are very famous for this. They draw upon literature or they draw upon something and they create like, if like I said, I asked you to send me the lyric sheet because I like, first of all, I love to read. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, I, I, on a sensory level, get something out of reading someone's lyric sheet without the singer singing at me. Oh, in, isola in isolation, yeah. I like to read uh, the the lyrics as like a poem or prose or whatever. In your case, on this record, it's obviously poetic, but it almost seems more prosy, if you will. So back to my original. I'm set. I don't know if you know this, Ian. Sometimes I stall so I can give people a chance to think about the question. I'm not just rambling. <laughs> this is tactful because I know I've asked you a big one. Do you have particular narrative influences, maybe outside of music, that you you draw upon when you're conceiving of lyrics for a record like particularly like this one. Oh my god uh do you need me to stall longer yeah a lot longer um no i think it just i think it's just uh i think it's maybe just all the stuff i've read has probably you know the thesaurus was the biggest reading thing <laughs> for this record you know like uh that was probably the biggest thing but you know just like uh God, I don't know. No, it's fair. I, it's it, like I said, it's a big question. I don't need specifics necessarily, but as a storyteller, when we earlier, I'm like, this might be your most ambitious record. Uh, this this sounds like it took a lot more out of you than maybe others uh, in some ways. Uh, you have done all sorts of things. You've written sort of um, pop songs. You've written punk like short blasts of music that are expressing feelings and thoughts. This just seems a little more focused and ah. I can't help but wonder if that is a result of you being like, I really want to say something on this whole record. I, this whole record is a statement. It's not just song, 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 and, and one feeling follows another. That's where I'm coming from. So I can't help but wonder if you draw upon people who have had similar ambitions of like trying to tell some sort of narrative over the course of a record. Oh man. I don't think I ever go like, Oh, I want to make a statement that I know that for sure. Right. Are you, uh, are you saying the concept just emerged? Like you, you, this could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually, the way I work is very like, uh, I just, honestly, I just go with whatever's going. Hmm. And then after the fact, if I don't like it, then it's gone. But, uh, up until that moment, I'm, I just work on it through instinct. Yeah. And just sort of go with whatever happens. So the concept emerged because 
that second skin song actually came very early in the whole thing. And I was like, well, this is something we could explore. I mean, because like, you know, there's things like Alice Cooper schools out, for example, it, even though you probably wouldn't hear the influence on this record, it is very, uh, there is a strong influence because one of the things they do is they bring back musical themes throughout that record. Yeah. And, uh, there's a the second sting chorus comes you know happens three times in the song, every time in a different key, and then it comes back at the whole end of the record one more time in a different key. So yeah, there's just little things like that. So yeah, I guess looking at things like, uh, I mean Bob Ezrin Productions, he always does th little things like that. Um, so I guess I was more like looking at like, well, how did how did these people put these records together, and how did the people that I really love put these records together, you know? So it's like Bob Ezrin is obviously very good at it. He's, you know, the wall and stuff like that. I'm trying to think of who else. But you do respect lyricists and you do like the, like you're, like I said, like you're just laughing about me asking about the lyric sheet. It is important for you to convey something. It's not like you're dismissing the lyrics that you write. You just don't feel, no, no, you no. just don't feel comfortable elaborate they, they are what they are well yeah because i think uh you know a lot of times people misinterpret lyrics anyways uh and get their own thing out of it it's like you know like maybe you have a favorite song and on one day the third line in the first verse is the thing you're like oh my god i love that line and then later on you're like oh my god i really love the second and third line in the second verse you know yeah. it's like so it's like as humans we change every day and so i think nailing this down to being one thing is like you know it's like i'm not even going to feel that way about it necessarily in six months so to expect somebody else to yeah i think there's so much going on in the record in terms of the music and the vocals are multi multi-tracked as i mentioned like it can be i appreciate i just want to thank you again for sending me i don't i don't imagine a lot of people are going to see these lyrics on the page uh, i don't no, they're not they're not included they're not. in the record right so no uh, i just want to say for what it's worth i appreciated it i i was nice to see I, you come back to um a verse and just alter one word sometimes uh you do that this is a thing you do a couple times on this record where you'll say a thing and the next time we come across that that verse it's almost the same, but you've altered a couple of words that yeah, that yeah. rhyme with the first ones, which is you know whatever. I'm not. I don't mean that. This isn't songwriting 101, but I, <laughs> but I do. Is it? I I it's, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading them. I think they're really great lyrics. The music's fantastic. I want to commend you on doing this. It's great and um, awesome. And it's inspiring awesome. to me awesome. because, as you know, uh, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and for me to feel. Even if you, if no one else agrees or you don't think it's true, the feeling I've had is like, oh, my God, at this point in our lifetime, Ian Blurton has made his most elaborate and ambitious record. I'm just I just want to say, like, even if you don't agree, I feel inspired by that. It's inspiring. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, before. I mean, and sorry. And just one thing I, I, I should probably add about the lyrics is that like Rob Taylor, who most people don't even know this, but Rob Taylor, who is the bass player in Change of Heart, he wrote a lot of the lyrics for the band and I sang them sort of thing. Right. And so he's, he's always been my biggest influence in terms of that. Hmm. And so I always, I always feel like I'm like, I have to, you know, sort of, I'm not judging myself against him, but I feel like there's like, he's, he's got a peak that uh, is quite high. It's a nice, uh, a nice shout out for Rob. That's very, that's gracious of you. And I'm glad you'd, Oh, I mean, it's so true. It's like, yeah. I honestly, I, you know, I don't think necessarily the band would, people would remember it as much without some of the lyrics because they just, they resonate with people. You know? Yeah. And they're hooky. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's fascinating to read some of the reviews that have come in for this record in particular, because you'll see people being like, more or less the, one of the general uh, themes I see in the reviews is I can't believe how catchy this is. I, right. I, I, this is unusually infectious. Like uh, right. I, that's a huge compliment to your your pop songwriting craft, if you will. Like you manage right. everything you've done. Like it, it's fascinating to me how well you've your pop sensibilities are always present. Right. Whether it's metal right. or hardcore punk or whatever sound is going on around you, that's in mm -hmm. that's in your voice as well. My I was I think I told you this in a phone call recently. Uh, my wife and I were 
desperately trying to assemble a barbecue. Took all day, and uh, in the backyard, and I had this record playing, and I had started before my wife uh, did, and she came out as your record was playing, and instantly knew it was you. Instantly, like, well, is her initial is there a new come on record? That's what she initially said. Right. And I said, no, no, it's Ian's new thing. It's Future Now. And she's like, oh, my God. He's just got such a distinctive voice. And I thought that was a very high compliment and astute on my wife's part. I'm going to compliment mm-hmm. my wife on her compliment to you. Because um, I think that was... <laughs> I will as well. I think that was very astute. You're your own thing. So uh, as we're speaking, I haven't yet received the uh, vinyl copy of this record that I ordered. But the album artwork even in my digital realm here, uh, stands out for me uh, as, right. as really interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? What the What's going on and who is responsible for this image? Jeremy Brunel did the actual painting. Adam Swinborn did the logos. And Louis Duran did the whole layout of the whole package. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was really the three of them. Jeremy and I talked a long, quite a long time ago because uh, he put in crazy amount of hours on that painting like it's an actual painting it's not a uh, and, and, and it was commissioned for the cover it was commissioned for the cover and we worked pretty close together on it um in fact uh, like i gave he's the one of the other only other people that have the lyrics um but i gave him <laughs> i gave him like you know 30 or 40 lines that i really liked from the record and so he's incorporated them onto the cover so it's like if you're actually looking at the cover it sort of is like a lyric. Okay, sheet. good. That's good to know. Okay, I hadn't. Yeah. I just saw it, and it's quite. Uh, I don't know what the word is. The album cover is. It's elaborate. It, it's elaborate. It's elaborate, and it's loud. If I may, like, it's not bright colors per se. There's a, but it's like a lot of stuff is going on, and I, oh I can't God. wait. It's, like I say, I can't wait to actually hold it in my hand so I can really stare at it. And I appreciate the fact now that you've revealed that there maybe are some lyrical, if not, if it's not completely lyrical, Easter eggs. Uh, that it's, I would say at least 80% That's awesome okay. lyrics, yeah. Well I wanted to give a shout out there Because I feel like speaking of people who did a lot of work I could see that on the cover And uh, again I appreciate your attention to detail And Jeremy's as well What's next for Future Now As we're speaking uh, I know you've got a couple of shows Is that right? No only one We're playing uh, Saturday August 13th At the Horseshoe Tavern In downtown Toronto with uh, Sam Coffey in the Iron Lungs and Sick Things, who are from Montreal, who we did a split seven inch with that came out in the spring. Um, they're one of my favorite bands. I, I love them. Uh, and uh, they're old friends, so it's always great to see them. Hmm. And um, we're about 75% finished our new record. Um, Another one? So, yes. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh- yeah. So uh, that's sort of where we're at right now. And is there, when you say 75% done, have you done the lyric stuff yet? Oh, yeah, the vocals are all done, and uh, my guitars and Glenn's drums are all done. Oh, nice. Um, I've actually started sort of mixing a song. But, yeah, it's pretty much done. Uh, Gregory from Sloan has been helping out with the backup vocals, too. So Oh, lovely. A little, a little uh, twist on the last record. So. That's like his main gig is singing backup vocals in Sloan and playing. The man is a kid. King at it. Oh my God. Can you make it sound more Def Leppard? I sure can. Yeah. Is that an instruction you gave someone? Yeah. Make yeah, it more yeah. Def Leppard. I didn't realize yeah. that. So you're you're yeah, yeah. you're ensconced in kind of eighties hard rock right now. I don't know. I just think that backup like the earlier Def Leppard backup vocals are pretty spectacular. Right. right, right, and, right, right, uh, right, right. It, it's not just it's a Mutt Lang thing, right? As well. Yeah. Um so yeah, well it's Queen too. So actually, it's more. Like, there's a lot of seventies. Okay, there. nice. Yeah. You know, I mean, the days. main, the main, or it's like Queen, Sweet, and uh, Def Leppard, and they're all actually pretty similar. Yeah, that's ways. true. Actually, that's true. So are you? I don't want to uh, hear too much because I want to be surprised like everyone else. But again, is there a conceptual aspect to the songs on the new record that you're picking up on already? Uh, conceptually less singing. That's <laughs> a lot oh, there's less, less singing. singing. Yeah, way less singing, and a little. It's just a lot more stripped down. I, I, I. The way I've always worked is I'm sort of reactionary to the record previous. Right. So it's it's a very stripped down record. There's actually 
I don't think there's any double tracked vocals in any of the verses. Oh, okay. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's like sort of taking away a lot of the stuff that uh, we did on the last record. And have you played any shows during the pandemic? I haven't played a show in two and a half years. Holy so shit. this is my first show in two and a half years. Have you been to any? Uh, I went and saw Black Crows uh, a couple weeks ago because the guitar player from Earthless is in the band. And, okay. I mean, I like Black Crows anyways, but that was a that was a bonus for me. He's a fantastic guitar player. Um, okay. And yeah, he shredded. And, you know, it was outside too. I actually haven't even been inside to a show or anything. So it's we'll going to be it probably going to be a bit weird. Oh my for, God, it's going to be so weird. But I think as soon as you start going, you'll forget. Uh, oh yeah, about yeah, the yeah. weirdness. So, well, that's exciting. If people want to learn more about uh, Ian Blurton's future now, where would you send them on their telephones, their computers, and uh, just ianblurton.bandcamp.com is that has where all my music. Um, uh, yeah, or Instagram Ian Blurton or Twitter at Ian Blurton. Okay, and the record is has it been distributed to record stores or is ordering? Yeah, it's in a few stores. It's a it came out on a U.S. label called Seeing Red as well. Um, so like basically the Canadian copies are more for shows, right? And uh, Thomas from Seeing Red is sort of taking care of the distribution outside of that. Yeah, and they've got the colored vinyl. Is that correct? Yeah, they have two color variants um, and a glossy cover, and our the Canadian version is a matte cover with a bonus poster and all black virgin vinyl. Shit, which one did I order? I think I ordered the one from your band camp. Which one am I getting? Yours? Are you sending? You're me getting the black one. You're getting the black one with the poster. So you're telling me I got to order the other one from Seeing Red? Okay, I'll do that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that one too. I want the <laughs> I want the different one. I'm gonna get both. Oh. Yeah, no, it's there's three. Is, is it a double? It must be a double. No, it's album? not. It's 45 minutes, no. right? It's 45 minutes. No, yeah. it's 40 minutes. Like, oh, it's 40? Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. It was very, very, very... Yeah, we we actually had to chop an intro off a song to get the whole record to fit. That's a thing I forgot to... I was I had it in my thoughts there. Uh, is there anything that you recorded uh, for this record that didn't make it on? Yeah. Uh, actually, there was a the split 7-inch that we put out with Sick Things that came out on Yeah, Right, a song called Bleed Out was recorded there uh there's one song that will never see the light of day and uh <laughs> <laughs> there's uh one extra song that'll probably come out in the fall oh, okay that's cool the, that's the last song that's from this whole session you didn't save anything and put it on whatever the new record's gonna be uh nothing no it's pretty different actually okay. the, yeah it's pretty different okay cool well, I appreciate this time. I want to go out on a song from this record, and I hope you can choose one for us to play. And also, doesn't matter how long it is, I'll just say that. And uh, also, uh, if, once, once you've chosen it, maybe tell us why it came to mind. Oh, well, I would say probably Second Skin, the title track. It's got a bit of everything that's the record's sort of about. It's got a I don't know, King Crimson Breakdown, it's got the Mellotron, it's got the Prog, it's got the, it's got solos, it's got how many <laughs> solos, three, three solos, I don't know, it's got a lot of solos, it's got a lot of singing, um, Glenn plays spectacular on this, this track, as does everyone, yeah, yeah, I don't know, there you go. No, that's fine, this, it's the title track too, right? Yes. So that's easy for me to say. This is the title track from the beautiful new album, uh, Second Skin by Ian Blurton's uh, Future Now. Ian, uh, always an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. I hope you had... Oh, my God. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I hope you had fun, and I wish you the best luck in the future. Always have fun. 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 Always have f
You know, all the way back in, I want to say it was 1997, Ian Burton was one of the first people I ever interviewed in my life. Did an article on him for the school newspaper, went to three Change of Heart shows that were playing at the university bar there in the winter of 97. So he means a lot to me. It's always meaningful for him to be, for, for me rather, for him to be back on the show. I don't know if it's, well, I think it is meaningful to him too. I think he appreciates it. Ian, if you're listening, thank you once again for being on the 707th episode of Creative Control. Everyone else, this show is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode you're looking for, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control on Facebook or follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly on Twitter and on Instagram at Vish Khanna. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to sustain this podcast. $6 or more a month grants you access to exclusive content. Uh, some of it is derived from uh, these interviews that you're hearing, these fresh interviews. We go do a little bit of overtime. Sometimes I dig into my archives, and maybe I'll someday, if I can convert some tape to uh, digital, maybe I'll dig up the very first interview I ever did with Ian Blurton and feature it. Man, <laughs> even I am skeptical about how good that might sound for my side of things, but uh, who knows? That's the kind of stuff you get. Again, $6 or more a month gets you access to that stuff, but you can uh, donate anything you want. And if you're interested in receiving a Creative Control t-shirt, just message me on Patreon and I'll get you one while supplies last. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, the bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show. Thanks as always to my friend Jim Guthrie for letting me use some music of his on this show. You can learn more about Jim and his work at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you so much for listening to this episode with Ian Blurton. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with Ian, I hope you'll check out his work and, uh, and, and... Got a good feeling about uh, him from this chat. For a longtime fan, thanks for uh, checking out uh, Ian on this show. And uh, and uh, hopefully you'll spread the word about it. Subscribe to this show. Follow it. Tell your friends about it. All that stuff helps me and the show thrive. So thank you in advance for that stuff. Thank you for listening to this. I hope you're well and will continue to be well. And I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>